So the way the ALMA program works, it is a low residency program. It is a two year degree. And the way it functions, you know, people ask me, oh, is it virtual? Well, kind of, but not quite. Uh, you have to be a participant in two residencies. We have one in the summer and one in the winter. They are 10 days each. The first one will be this June and it will be on the campus of, of ALMA. And you go to the 10 day residency. It's kind of an intense experience. You have lectures, workshops, there will be readings and you bond with your cohort. You also get matched up with a faculty mentor and you develop a study plan, what you will be uh, working on over the course of the next five months, your goals, your reading list, how you will uh, submit your packets. And then once you leave, you will be responsible for sending your mentor five monthly packets. They will each be about 25 pages of creative and critical work. The critical work will be based on your reading for, for, um, for the term. And you'll be writing about techniques you gleaned from your reading, uh, craft elements, things that you're trying to learn and incorporate in your creative work. At the end of the program, you'll be able to demonstrate a proficiency of writing skills, strong use of organization, structure, an adept use of language, an understanding of craft, and also you'll have the ability to lecture on technique. You'll have the ability to read and think critically as a writer. Now, the way that I like to talk about this, uh, because this is the way I went into uh, learning for my own MFA, because um, I was already a published writer when I went into my MFA program, I felt as though I knew how to write, but I didn't understand uh, my craft. So it's like having a magic wand that um, I knew that if I waved it around, things would happen, but I didn't know why or how it worked. So once I went through my MFA program, I was able to wield that wand with precision to understand it, to use my magic intentionally, if you wanna put it that way. So that's the, the wonderful thing about the MFA program. You're also connected to a community of writers who are interested in the craft just as you are and you will remain connected. You'll see that you'll make tremendous friends that, that will be your support even after you graduate. And you'll be learning from some of the most amazing people. I'm happy to announce, if you didn't already know this, that the US Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo, will be kicking off our very first residency. She will be with us. She will do a craft lecture specifically for our students. And then she will give a public reading in the evening. Our residencies will also feature publishing experts, literary agents, editors from uh, large and small publishing houses and literary journals, just so that you know how the world of publishing works and where your work fits within it. We have a tremendous staff of faculty mentors. Uh, you'll meet three of them tonight, but I also want to let you know who else is on the faculty. Uh, Danielle Clayton will be uh, teaching fiction. Matthew Gavin Frank is a fabulous nonfiction writer uh, specializing in um, lyrical essays. Anna Clark is a nonfiction writer, also uh, focusing on long form journalistic nonfiction. Uh, one of her books, is um, a tremendous um, examination into the Flint water crisis. Benjamin Garcia is a fabulous poet, uh, award-winning poet. We'll also have uh, Kieste Lehman, an, another well-known uh, nonfiction writer. He'll be joining us in 2022. He's, he's uh, tied up with another project right now, but he'll be joining us in another year. Jim Daniels is a multi-genre writer and uh, also a graduate of Alma College, and uh, he will be with us as well. But tonight, you're going to meet these three faculty mentors, and I'll talk more about the program after uh, letting them speak for a little bit, but for you to know more about the genres that they represent, but also how it is, what it's like to work with a faculty mentor. So the first one tonight is Karen E. Bender, and Karen is the author of two story collections, Refund 
which was a finalist for the National Book Award in fiction. Uh, it was also shortlisted for the Frank O'Connor International Story Prize and longlisted for the Story Prize. Her collection, The New Order, was longlisted for the Story Prize. Her novels are Like Normal People, which was a national, sorry, a Washington Post Book of the Year and a Los Angeles Times bestseller and A Town of Empty Rooms. And her fiction has appeared in so many different places, magazines such as The New Yorker, uh, The Harvard Review, The Yale Review, and Zoetrope. So I'm going to stop sharing my slide here so that you can see and speak to Karen Bender. <laughs> and uh, by the way, everyone, sorry, I forgot to mention that, that you will be, there'll be plenty of time to ask us questions uh, when we're done with this brief bit here. So thank you. Take it away. Karen. Thank you, Sophronia. Um, I am so excited to be part of this. I think this is, it's really exciting to be part of a new program um, that's just starting and seeing how we can create it. And I, you know, the team that Sophronia has put together is amazing. Um, so what, um, what I do in terms of fiction is I think about how to help students um, kind of find what they want to say. I think it's often hard to figure out what you want to say. I think we're often told what we should say, you know, especially in our culture, what we should think. And actually part of how I teach fiction is helping you figure out what you want to say in your own particular unique strangeness. Um, and I do that kind of three ways. One is I help you figure out, you know, what you want to say that's really honest and it doesn't have to be necessarily literally true, but needs to be in some way emotionally true. With fiction, it's often literally not true, <laughs> but um, you know that you. But you take something that maybe feels like something that has, that you notice, that you feel, that feels like you need to say it, and you find a way to say it um, through your fiction. Um, craft is is the funnel through which you pour your honesty, so that um, you learn different elements of craft, sensory detail, dialogue, scene, plot, um, and you know there are different. Kind of techniques used. I mean, they're all the same techniques, whether it's a novel, short story, um, flash fiction, um, whether it's speculative or whether it's realistic or historical, they all actually use the same kind of um, tools. So we'll go over that. And then the other thing is that writing is really a conversation with what you read. And we all have different books that we love. You know, and we all have come to writing because we love reading. So part of it is I want to find out what you love to read, what books have been really important to you, what authors, and then jumping from there, you know, what are authors that might be similar that you might respond to, what authors might stretch you that you don't know about. So I think it's all about figuring out what you want to say and do and helping you give you, get you the tools to do that. Um, I'm also a huge proponent of revision. I feel like it's a myth <laughs> that lightning hits you and then suddenly you're a genius and you have written a, something which is not true. It was such a relief to me when I found out it's not true. So what I think is helpful is seeing how writing gets better over drafts. It's amazing. And I often do a lot of revision um, uh, over packets with um, with mentees. I've done in other residency programs. Um, uh, well, I know we'll, we'll do a workshop, I think in the residency itself, you know, we think of ways to, you know, ideas for revision for the pieces you turn in. So that's a huge part of it um, for me. And also, you know, in terms of, you know, just writing, you know, being part of a community is so important and how we can help each other figure out places to send our work or advice for each other's work within the, you know, community of the program is also really important, I find. So that's, um, and my own work is, I started as a, as a real, as a realist. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, just like, I thought the world was just so weird. I had to be real to, to capture it. But um, as I've sort of gone through life, I've become a lot more speculative. And uh, my last, my new collection I'm working on now is completely speculative. So writing can really change. I think being open to all the different things you can do is important too. So that's, those are my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. So I found out that the slides didn't work. So my apologies for that. So, um, but we don't have to go back to them. I can talk from there. So um, the next faculty member is Leslie Contreras Schwartz. And Leslie is the fourth Houston Poet Laureate. She's the author of three collections of poetry, Black Dove, Paloma Negra, Fuego, and Night Bloom and Cenote. 
which was a semifinalist for the 2017 Tupelo Press Dorset Prize, judged by Ilya Kaminsky. Her work, including essays and short stories, has appeared in Pleiades, The Missouri Review, Pank, Iowa Review, Verse Daily, Catapult, and Zykamps. 21 Mexican American writers of the 21st century. She's collaborated or been commissioned for poetic projects with the city of Houston, the Houston Grand Opera, and the Moody Center of the Arts at Rice University. Thank you for being here, Leslie. Thank you, Sophronia. I'm excited to be here. And I agree with so much that Karen said. Um, you know, I really enjoy working with students because this is their time to grow and also to you know hone all the tools that they need to revise their own work to think critically and to create a community with their cohort and be able to take these skills with them so the packets um it's an intense process and it, it's exciting to me because we're looking at your creative work and we're giving it a careful attention from the standpoint of craft. So in addition to critical analysis, which is different than what you might be familiar with, it's looking at uh, works of uh, other poets, um, less so for meaning, but looking at how craft techniques create meaning, looking at it very closely. So for poetry, looking at line lengths, looking at line breaks, all of those technical parts of a poem that can be changed and moved around and altered. Um, and you'll be able to take that critical analysis and apply it to your own work um, and practice. This is a, a, a place to practice. And that's why we go back and forth with the packets because you'll get feedback on your revisions, on new work. And over the course of the semester, you'll start to learn, okay, I can take this part of revising and that's what I'm gonna focus on in the next semester. Um, and it, you really get to tailor it to what you are inspired to write about, how you want to create meaning in your own work. But also you will get a lot of guidance from us. Um, we can recommend what we think would be relevant to your work. Um, and I think, uh, Sophronia, do you know about in their final bibliography, how many books over the course of the program they would read? Sorry, I have to hit my unmute. Sorry. Um, if you think about it, it's about eight books at minimum, eight books a semester. So if you think uh, four terms, you know, 32 books, right? Sometimes more, because I, I don't know about you, but I found myself reading well beyond my reading right. because one thing would lead to another. And, and I just found myself reading voraciously throughout the program. Yes. Um, so I would, for, for my students, I would be picking from all over the place, not just, you know, what you may have been uh, exposed to, of course, Lucille Clifton, uh, Marie Howe, we'll go back to them uh, and look at them with careful attention, but I'll also introduce you to poets that you may not know, uh, Anna Akhmadova, for instance, or uh, Sabignu Herbert, um, you know, translations uh, into English. Um, and when we look at them, you're, it, it'll be the first time for you to be reading poetry with an attention to how the poems work, how they work te technically and how they create meaning. Um, and then how you can do that yourself. So I'm excited to be here. I love watching other writers grow, um, and I can't wait. So thank you, Sophronia. Thank you, Leslie. Our third faculty member with us this evening is Donald Quist. 
representing nonfiction. Donald is the author of the linked story collection for other ghosts and the essay collection Harbors, a Forward Indies bronze winner and international book awards finalist. His writing has appeared in Agni, Poets and Writers, North American Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, The Rumpus, and was notable in Best American Essays 2018. He's also creator of the online fiction series Past 10, and he received fellowships from Sundress Academy for the Arts and Combilio Fiction. And he is currently a Gus T. Rigel Fellow in the English PhD department at the University of Missouri. So welcome, Donald. Hi, how are you? Um, hopefully I sound okay. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all um, tonight. Um, I'll be doing nonfiction um, with hopefully uh, as many people as possible because I love this genre. I love how malleable it is. Um, and I want to kind of share that enthusiasm with you. Um, so I'm kind of going to give you a rundown of how I like to approach working with students or with mentees. Um, I like to think of my experience as an invitation, um, an invitation for you to like draw from, to sort of find out a path for you in publishing and writing and teaching that feels most authentic to your goals and like your life. Um, I view myself sort of as like a guide on the side. I'm gonna be working with you to show you that there is room for your voice there is room for your stories and the world is hungry for them and they and they want to hear what you have to say um in terms of like the down and dirty practical interactions um i'm a heavy believer that uh writers should read more than they write <laughs> um i think i think there's a lot that can be learned from as leslie said reading with intention um so I want to make reading lists with you. I want us to work together, collaborate on that. I'm going to point you to some new authors you might not have heard of. Um, and also, I, I really strongly am going to encourage you to read some critical theory. I'm going to probably introduce you to some theoretical texts um, because I want you to think more about who your work is in conversation with, um, think about why you do the things you do, why you're attracted to the traits that you're attracted to um, and what your work can do for others um, through theoretical frameworks. I feel like that's a, a great way to think more thoughtfully about intention and more thoughtfully about what your work can do, it, its potential. Um, I would love to do regular Zoom meetings with you all, like uh, with every packet, we're going to see uh, how that will work in terms of uh, workload um, and also Zoom fatigue. We'll see. <laughs> but I would like it to be a conversation. I want to check in with phone calls. I want it to feel like um, I want to feel like a member of your community. I want you to feel like you have a support system in this craft that you are dedicating so much time and energy in. Um, I don't want you to feel um, alone in that. So I'm gonna try to be as involved in your life as you'll let me be <laughs> without getting annoying. Um, in terms of how I engage with mentees, I was just recently reading George Saunders and he mentioned um, intuition and iteration when it comes to writing. Um, I think every writer has their own intrinsic voice, their own authentic voice. My job is to try to get you to refine it. I want you to think about what you want to say, how you want to say it, the best way you want to say it. I want you to trust your intuition and I want us to practice. Um, Karen talked about revision, yes. <laughs> um, it's not done overnight. Um, a lot of times I think we get in the mindset thinking good writing just appears to us. This is a practice and we have to practice it. And so I want to go through revisions with you. I want to introduce you 
to new craft elements, I think one of the universal rules of art and architecture is form follows function. So I want us to look at different ways authors craft their narratives. How do they structure them? Um, and how can we find the best structure for the message that you want to convey? To me, that is one of the things nonfiction is all about. It is so varied um, and you can do so much with it. You can incorporate other genres into it. Um, and I think that's just so exciting and so cool to, to think through. We have like limitless possibilities on the page. So um, I'm gonna try to push you to broaden your reading, push you to try new forms um, to fit the function of sort of your heart song. Um, like what are the things you wanna say? Let's, let's try them out. So that's my approach. Um, and I look forward to working with some of you. I think you're muted. <laughs> I am, thank you. Thank you, Donald. So I wanted to point out, you know, we've, we have uh, the representation of fiction, nonfiction and poetry. And usually you would come into the program of studying one of these genres. But we also know that this is an exploration process and you may come into the program you know, wanting to study fiction, but because you've been in a lecture with Donald about nonfiction, you're thinking, wow, that's really interesting. I'd like to try my hand at that. Uh, we have made the, the degree flexible in a certain way. You can do a multi-genre degree. You could do one semester in uh, another genre just to try it out. But if you fully want to study two genres, we do have the option of a dual genre degree. Uh, that would take a little longer. You would have to uh, do another semester uh, and go to six residencies instead of five. And I, I speak from experience because that's what happened to me. I went into my MFA to study fiction and someone said to me, what do you, you know, who, who knew my work as a journalist and also knew some of my essay writing, like, you know, you could be writing essays, you should be studying nonfiction as well. And I had never considered that. You know, I, I especially didn't know the term creative nonfiction because I was a journalist. And I thought creative nonfiction, that sounds like something that would get me fired in my old job, what is that? But um, not only did I, I learn about creative nonfiction, I, I found that I had a voice that could find expression there in a way that I, I wouldn't necessarily have as a fiction writer. So I did a dual genre degree in fiction and nonfiction. And I actually now publish in both. So it's it's a tremendous opportunity if you, if you find that your expression needs a broader base. So I am going to open it up for questions and we can talk about any aspect of the program. You can ask questions of the faculty uh, or your specific situation, but that's what we're here for. And you can raise your hand or you could just speak up. I have a question about the, the genre um, kind of way that you um, designate nonfiction versus fiction, because Donald mentioned that you can incorporate different genres within your nonfiction. And then you're talking about creative nonfiction. And I guess I don't really have a clear idea of how solid and specific nonfiction is. Um, and, and therefore, because I don't know that, I don't know which one I would truly be more drawn to, fiction versus nonfiction. Nonfiction, even when you put that word creative nonfiction there, nonfiction is nonfiction. You're not making any of it up. Okay. The reason that it's called creative nonfiction is because you are using aspects, um, the tools of a fiction writer to make it beautiful, right? You're, the way you use dialogue, the way you use description, um, the way you use setting and scene, right? So, so you're making it um, read like it, like it could be fiction, like it's beautiful, but, it, but it's all real. 
right? So it's like you could read a book. Um, for example, uh, I mentioned Anna Clark's book on um, the Flint water crisis, right? Now, that is not an academic treatise, right? You could write it that way and it could be a paper and a study, but it's, it's a piece of journalism, but it also reads uh, almost like a, a, a novel, right? Because you have, you have villains, right? You have people who made these poor decisions. Um, you have um, characters who, who experience um, horrible health issues. So it's, it's a story and she is telling the story. So that's, that's what the line between creative, that's what creative, the creative piece of creative nonfiction is. Thank you, that makes perfect. It's confusing, a lot of people yeah. confuse it, but yeah. Thank Can you. I piggyback off of that? Yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of uh, furthering that, like um, one of the things that's really cool about creative nonfiction is you could also pull poetic syntax into it. Um, so some of my favorite essays read like poetry. Um, I think of like uh, the book Intimate by Paisley uh, Ruckpole. Um, that rides this weird line between creative nonfiction and poetry um, and a little bit of fiction too <laughs> because it's imagined, but because it's nonfiction, there's always like a note that says, here's what I think could have happened instead of jumping into Mm -hmm. like a full-blown fabrication um so that's one of those distinctions it it blends a lot of a lot of genre you know i'm um, donald when you put it that i i play with something like that in in my thomas merton book right so um, exactly. i have this book that, that's coming out next month and it's called the seeker and the monk everyday conversations with thomas merton and I wanted to write about um, my engagement with his journals, but this guy's been dead for 50 years. And, and yet I feel a connection to him and I write parts of the book in such a way that I, I address him directly. You know, I'm reading his journal and then, you know, almost like you would be reading something and talking to the book. I, I write the book that way. There are times when I'm talking to him. And of course I'm not really talking to him. <laughs> Right, but it's it's not made up either, so it's it's it walks that weird line. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. You know, when you open doors like that, you have no idea where you can go. <laughs> That's the marvelous thing of, about learning to write in this way is that you yeah. realize you have so many options available to you. It's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what else? I was wondering, could you go over some of the application requirements and deadlines? Yes, I can. And let me see if I can even uh, pull this up for you because I know I'm not going to do the slideshow because I know that didn't work when I tried to share that before, but let me see if I can share this, just this one screen for you. Okay, can you see this, the application process? Yes, no, Jonah? Oh. Okay. Okay. So, right. so these are the, the requirements. Uh, we would like your uh, transcripts from each college or university attended because um, a couple of people uh, uh, have come to us, for example, having earned degrees in other fields. So uh, transcripts for, for each school you've attended, a curriculum vitae or resume, a creative writing sample. So this is uh, 25 pages for fiction or creative nonfiction, a maximum of 10 pages for poetry, no more than one poem per page. Uh, a couple of different essays we're asking for. So you, the personal essay is about your journey as a writer. You know, why are you specifically interested in the Alma College MFA? And what has been your preparation for pursuing a formal study of creative writing? How do you see your own writing? What are your strengths and, what, and weaknesses? Uh, what are your goals? You know, what do you hope to learn in the program? And also uh, talk about any additional experience that you feel you can bring to the program. You know, maybe you've had um, an experience in a, a different field uh, that you feel can um, help in the workshop process. 
a, you're a communicator or you're a, a great team member, things like that. The literature essay, uh, we'd like to know what you like to read. You know, who are, are the writers that have influenced you? Uh, what are the books that, um, that you, your go-to books when you think about writing or, or what excites you, uh, you know, on the written page? Uh, we want you to be excited about reading because as Leslie pointed out, you're gonna be doing a lot of reading in the program. Now, it's okay if, if you're not already an extensive reader because sometimes people, you know, life has happened and you haven't been able to focus on either your writing or reading in this extensive way. And maybe this is going to be your opportunity to do so. What we want is an openness to reading because as a writer, this is, you have to read. It's just that vital to, to your learning, to um, just understanding this whole amazing literary world. So, um, so we want to know that you're open to reading. Two letters of recommendation, and they can either be from professors or if you've been out in the, uh, the work world for a while, they can be a supervisor. They don't have to know your writing because they may not, you know, you may not have shared your work before, but we do want to know what you're like in community. You know, what would make you a, a great cohort member? You know, what do you bring to, to our gathering? The summer residency deadline is May 1st. The winter residency deadline is November 1st. And if the cohort for the summer, you know, if you apply for the summer and the cohort has filled, then you would automatically uh, be, um, you would start in the winter and that's okay. But that's where we are. Uh, just so you know, the summer residency will be at Alma College and we will be at the Wright Lapine Opera House. It's a, a wonderful building that has uh, apartment style uh, rooms. We're, um, so you'll be staying there and also we will be having our lectures and some workshops in that building. In the winter, we will be at the McMullen Conference Center, which is in the wonderful pine woods of Northern Michigan, about an hour north of Alma. In January, 2023, we will be offering the option of an overseas residency and that will be at Oxford uh, University in England. Uh, we will be um, having some lectures from Oxford faculty and we will be staying on campus there and touring the literary history of that is the whole Oxford town. Thank you. You're welcome. What else, other questions? Sophronia? Yes. Hey, Mary Lou, please explain what you mean when I, when you say cohort, thought I knew what it meant, but not in the context in which you. Yeah, um, think of it, think of it as your class. So you come in this, this first cohort in June, you will be the first cohort and you will, it's your class. So you will be with each other throughout the program, even as other cohorts come in. Now, actually, I'm going to put it out to you guys. Anyone can email me with some thoughts. I think it would help if we named the cohorts. I would love to, to have each cohort given um, a specific name, maybe um, that's connected to the history or the, the, um, the nature of, of Michigan. So uh, for example, um, there a school where I taught in Colorado the cohorts all have the names of trees that are grown in color that grow in Colorado. So there was the aspen um, cohort, the blue spruce, the the conifers. So they went A, B, C, and so you would know how far down the cohorts have gone, and you would also know that by the time the graduation comes, that the the aspen were the first cohort. So um, so we'll probably name the cohorts. I just haven't uh, figured out what that name should be. But usually at the very basic, it would be oh that's the uh, first semester cohort, or this is the second semester, or that cohort is in the third semester. Does that explain it? Thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you do dual genre, you'll end up uh, graduating with this, the, the, 
the um, not with the cohort you started with, but the, the one that started after you, one year after you, so or one semester after you. Yes, Sarah, are you raising your hand? I can't tell. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I'm was sorry. Okay. <laughs> I have Jeff. a question about travel. Yes, Jacqueline. So um, I'm from Philadelphia, um, mm -hmm. kind of far from Michigan, I suppose. Um, what happens in the case of inclement weather? So let's just say I'm trying to get there for the residency and it's snowing terribly in Michigan and I can't get out there. What would happen in those situations? That's a good question because you know, I, I got my MFA in Vermont and that happened a lot, Donald knows, right? We actually had, um, there would be faculty that, that couldn't uh, show up. So the, the residency is 10 days. So I've never encountered a situation where someone couldn't get there at all over the 10 days. So you might be late, but, and that would be fine, but you would, you would still, I, I'm assuming that that the storm wouldn't be that bad that you couldn't be able to come at all. <laughs> okay, thank you. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and just so everyone knows, um, we are planning for this first residency to be in person. You know, um, Alma has handled the um, pandemic really well with its undergraduate classes. And, and, you know, that's way more students than we're going to be. So with, um, they have a great testing program if we still need that in June. So I think, um, and, and there will be enough space for us to be socially distanced. We need to do that. So I, I'm comfortable with us uh, being able to be in person in June. I actually do have a question now that I think about it. Um, yes. So during these residencies, these 10 day periods, we're all together and there's this community and this bonding with these cohorts and you have your mentor and you have this sort of support network, but how much interaction is there between the students in your cohort in between those residencies? Like, do you have, I know Donald was talking a little bit about like wanting his group to get together as much as possible, but is that something that's going to be kind of built in or is that just sort of at the discretion of the, the mentor? There will, there, there will be, you know, social media com, um, community groups. So I, and I, I mean, not just with the mentor that you're working with, because I don't know if you guys know learning management systems, but we have Canvas, right? So, so those are the learning management systems. And if a, an instructor like Donald wants his students to communicate and share work with each other, they can do that within the learning management system within Canvas. But as a whole co cohort, you'll find that, I, that the group may be communicating anyway, right? That, that you will be, you may even form your own Facebook groups. Uh, you'll be emailing each other and figuring out how to stay in touch um, because it's, it's, I can't describe it. it. It seems to naturally happen. And then you just continue it even after you graduate. And I, I can, say, yeah. actually, yeah, you can speak to that. I Don and I that. actually went to school together. Yeah. So, we, so you see, we're still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was amazing how it happened. It was uh, just um, after that first residency, somebody made a Facebook group and then without fail, every cohort that followed had their own Facebook group and um, people, I don't, I think it's this, it's this experience where for the first time for many of you, this will be the first time you're with a group of people um, who share your passion at this level for something. Um, and when you find those people, it's not, that easy to shake like you're gonna want to you're gonna want to stay in contact with them and I'm sure like Leslie and Karen can talk about this too like I I would bet anything that there are folks that they met um through their educational um process like pursuing degrees that you just find a way to stay connected to each other because no one no group of people is going to get you this way um yeah. 
Yeah, Karen, can you speak to that? Because you mentioned that in the, the Faculty Friday video, I think that we recently ran. Right, yeah. I mean, I remember when I, I got to my grad program and, and the director said, uh, you found your, here is your tribe. And I was like, yes, it's true. I just felt like I finally was with the group that I felt like I belonged with, you know, writers. I felt like I'd never been with writers, people who wanted to really be serious about it. I mean, it's a difference, you know, when you're actually really committing to it, it really feels like a deep, a deep bond, you know, it's true. And I think it's really true. People find ways to, to connect. And I mean, I still have friends, you know, on Facebook that were, connected from grad school, you know, many years later. So I think um, it's very true. And it's interesting to think about different ways of creating community within the program outside of the residency too. And we help each other with our, our books, right? We, we Oh yeah, right. Work, we help promote each other's books. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. I really liked, uh, there was a story, I think it's in the faculty, you know, we have a YouTube channel. So if you look up the, our MFA, um, there's a series of videos called Faculty Friday, where all of the faculty are there, there are readings from the faculty. And uh, Matthew Gavin Frank tells this story of how he worked in the restaurant business for the longest time. And, but he was writing poetry and lyrical essays on the side. And he said that they would go out, you know, afterwards, um, after service, and they would be in a bar and talking about, well, what do we, do? you know, what do you like to do when you're not here working at the restaurant for like 12 hours a day? And he said, well, I, I like to write lyrical essays. And he said, he said the person would look at him as though they wanted to just finish their drink as quickly as possible and not talk to him anymore. <laughs> and so he was, he was just thrilled to learn that there was a place where he could say that to people and, and not have them turn away from him. <laughs> Oh. What else? Any other questions? We had a, I think we had a question from Carrie. Oh, yes. Um, uh, in the chat. And then I see Ellen's hand is up. Yeah. Okay. So Carrie, Carrie's asking if there's a limited number of spots in the cohort or limit on number of people per genre. Um, there's, not a no, there's not a limit on the number of people per genre. But the cohort, in order to, to keep it um, feasible and you know for the faculty, there's a limit. The faculty the faculty limit is five students per faculty, right? So that would put us at at the upper limit of forty for the initial cohort. Um, I think that's that's a that's a big number in terms of people getting to know each other, but it's a vibrant community of that size. So, and it will only grow because we would have more than one cohort on campus at any given time as we move on. But, um, but I think that first cohort is, is gonna be really special and we'll want to work with as many faculty members as possible. So, um, but yeah, that's, what, that's where we are with the numbers. And Carrie has a grumpy toddler. So, um, so we'll let Carrie know that she can get the recording to this so if you have her question answered. <laughs> And someone had their hand up, you said, Donald? Ellen, yes. Hi there. Um, wait, so, okay, the cohort is in your genre. And mm -hmm. anyone, everybody. No, the cohort is everybody in the class. Okay. So I say, okay. admit okay. the first cohort. That, yeah. that makes sense. Okay, so what I'm gonna add, two questions. Um, the um, the exposure, so you guys talked about this earlier. Um, I. I'm 99% sure I want to do creative nonfiction. Um, however, I've been really deep diving into writing lately, having, you know, my, I've always done nonfiction, um, but I'd like to get better and get more literary, but um, I really have been exposed to and interested in poetry mm -hmm. and then also fiction because both can inform my nonfiction, which is, I hope to be cre increasingly creative. Um, other than doing, a whole semester in one of the, can you get exposure to both of those in a deeper level? Like I have done some work with poetry and, but I, I, I don't need to get a degree in it, but right. I'd love, and, and maybe it would figure it out as I go, but is there right. a way to get experience to both of those? Yes, because all of the faculty will be lecturing during the residencies and you, you are not limited. Like 
we wouldn't say, oh, you can't go to Leslie's lecture, yeah. but he's lecturing on poetry, right? So that's that's how, for example, that's how I got exposed to creative nonfiction is, is attending lectures on it at residency. And then the other question is, um, I'm sure um, a lot of people in these low residencies aren't full-time students or juggling jobs and things. What kind of a reasonable time commitment? Um, I tend to probably want to put more time than less time, but what would be reasonable so you to, to prepare for so you don't find yourself going insane? Yeah. <laughs> that you don't, uh, well, actually, that's what the low residency format is, is created for people who, who can't leave their jobs or they, they can't move for a full-time program. So if you think it's, it's about 20, 25 hours a week, right? So it's the time it takes for you to, to you know, do your reading every day, um, do some, um, do your writing. Uh, whatever it takes for you to get that packet together to get to your advisor uh, that deadline every month right and it helps to you, it's not something that you can wait until the last minute to do so as long as you are giving yourself some time you know what um i don't know three four days a week you'll find that that once you're thinking about your writing all the time once you know that that you have to submit these deadlines it will it will become a natural part of your schedule, right? And and it won't feel crunch. It feels like like this is this is the thing that that I'm doing. Um, Donald, and I don't know if you remember this, Donald. You said this in one of the the videos that we did. You said that the great thing about the low residency program is that it prepares you for for real life because you're always going to be juggling your writing with the rest of your life, with your work life, and then yeah. where it begins. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciated the low residency model because um, where some of my peers that came out of traditional programs, when they left, they didn't have like a structure. Um, and so they kind of floundered a little bit. But because of the low res model, I, I when I graduated, I just kept doing what I was doing anyway. I had already figured out how to pull writing into like the everyday life. Um, and also Ellen, kind of going back to, you were talking about how you are drawn from a bunch of different like genres to influence your nonfiction like poetry. I know, and I'm pretty sure um, most of the faculty here will be open to you reading books from different genres. Um, I know like I would, I would wanna recommend it because I, most of us, I think most, most of us have written in different genres. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, like, I know the quickest way for me to get inspired by, inspired to write is to read a poem. Um, like, it, it does something to my brain. Um, and, like, so I, if, if we work together, I, I want you to pursue reading widely and cultivating your influences and yeah, broadening your reading. So I think you'll get exposure for sure. So. Donald, I just, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was actually, I was gonna ask you to say something, Leslie, because I was going to say several of our faculty, actually, um, that you can work with them in different genres. Like you may want to right. focus on one semester, but Leslie it can teach both poetry and essays. In, it, in, my, own, in my own reading life, I'm always reading in every genre, because I think uh, I'm growing as an artist um, first in the genre is just the, the way that it's framed. Um, so I, I love that you read poems to be inspired. I, I love reading novels. I love reading nonfiction. Um, and I wanted to mention the low residency model um, I also attended a low residency graduate program and I actually became a parent while I was doing it. And so I had a young baby when I returned, you know, I took a semester off and then I returned. So it really does prepare you. Um, it builds a resilience um, in you to return after you graduate to return to daily living, having a job, um, taking care of yourself in you know, shaping your life around becoming a serious writer. 
So if anyone's a parent or thinking about becoming a parent, you can do it, it's possible. Yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning that was like my son was seven when I started my MFA program and it was, it was the first time that, that I left him because you know, I would go away for, for 10 days at a time and, and my husband you know, had to be totally responsible for, for taking care of him. So, um, so, so yeah, it is, it is possible, but it's amazing what, what it takes to, to finally make that focus. And, and, but once you do it, it becomes incorporated in your life and it doesn't feel like something is, has to be lost because you're doing this one thing. It's all part of your life. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Um, so you've talked a little bit about dealing with the publishing industry. Um, yeah. One of my long-term goals for myself is I kind of want to uh, start my own publishing company. And mm -hmm. so I was wondering, like, to what extent would this help to prepare for that kind of a venture? Uh, actually, Josh, it's, um, it's interesting you ask that because I've been thinking about um, some of the people I want to bring to campus are people who have started their own publishing companies. Right. So... That, that's part of the life as well. Right? You, you will not only be a writer, you can be an editor, you can become an agent, you can start your own um, workshop series somewhere. Right? So I, I wanted you guys to learn all of these aspects of it. You could start your own literary journal. So, so you will definitely learn about that piece. So. Thank you. Can I ask um, if everyone could, could briefly unmute and just let me know what what do you write because I'm curious like what do you write Josh um so so my primary focus actually is drama um but I do also <laughs> write a lot of poetry <laughs> um and I've been trying to dabble in fiction I don't I <laughs> I have difficulty with longer projects sometimes so <laughs> so the follow-through can be like a little difficult sticking with one thing for that long <laughs> um but yeah that's cool and what about Deborah? What do you write? Um, I'm I'm kind of a new writer, and one of the things that um, that I feel sort of hopeful about is that there there feels like there might be space for someone who's just kind of beginning. Um, but I did a, a few years of just a little poetry workshop locally. I live in Kalamazoo, so I'm close to Alma, um, and just loved it. I loved the process and I, it just opened up a new world to me, but I, I'm just very much um, still kind of a beginner, I would say. And um, so, and then in, in my work life, I do a lot of um, kind of editing and sort of in dialogue with my boss who does a lot of writing. Um, and that's just been a really fun lively process with him to refine his writing and um, just be, just kind of learn, learn his voice and sort of add a little to that. So, um, so that's mostly my experience. And I was a dancer for a, a lot of my life. So there's, there's some, some kind of um, uh, resonance in that, in that, I think too, so. So I'm, I'm going to warn you, Deborah, uh, we recently accepted a student who also has a dance background. Oh. I already told her that I'm thinking of, of us doing a, a talent show. So, so <laughs> just, just so you know, there may be opportunities for you to put that talent on display. <laughs> That's really cool. She's up for organizing it. She already said yes. So <laughs> I'm joining you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So uh, Rose says she writes fiction and nonfiction. Thank you, Rose. Uh, Jonah, what do you write? Hi. Um. So I mainly write and read science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. So just like I was actually going to ask, it because obviously fiction encompasses realistic fiction and, and all and all these subgenres. So like, is there any kind of specialization? Let's say if I really wanted to get into military sci-fi or really into like epic fantasy. Cause that's kind of where my interests lie. So I wasn't sure like how that would work exactly. Well, first of all, good writing is good writing. 
right? Yeah. So you're talking about subject matter. So your your faculty person will, will go with you. So it's it's about um, it's about helping you with your craft, right? Um, but just so you know, we do have um, Danielle Clayton is on our faculty, and and she writes fantasy of many different types. So you you would also have you know a, a trained ear for that if, if you wanted to ever discuss that with her um, beyond working with it because you're going to work with several different faculty. You know you're not going to have the same mentor each semester, so you're going to have the experience of so many people. Thank you. You're welcome. Sarah, did you say what you write? Uh, no, actually, uh, so for for many years, I've actually written critical essays. I've been writing for um, a magazine um, called Forward Reviews, and we review independently published work. And um, before that, I had written a lot of creative nonfiction in college, but kind of throughout the years reading and writing about other people's writing. I was sort of like, this isn't what I want to do. I don't want to write about other people's writing <laughs> exclusively. I mean, it was really, really brilliant to read all of the all of the work that I was reading, but um, just kind of made me rethink why I was doing that and what my response to all of that was. And um, a lot of my favorite things to read are um, oddly like coming of age stories. And I have this like real soft spot for like the nostalgia of, um, of, you know, some of these, like my favorite author is Ray Bradbury and he writes like all these bromance stories. <laughs> and I think they're fantastic. Um, but I really- I, Yeah, I remember now, sir, we talked about this, about the sisterhood stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I feel like there's something missing in that like real nostalgic Yes. Framework or whatever, where women are just kind of missing from that. And I think a lot of it is because women didn't go to war and women didn't have like these big traumas that men have historically had. But um, yeah, that's just, that's sort of where, where I'm living in my mind. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ellen. Hey, I've, I've got another reading, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hop in real quick. Um, yeah, it was interesting. What is it, Joshua? Yeah, that's another area. I have a friend who writes musical theater and he keeps saying, I'd like to do something with you, which I've never done. So I don't know if there's much drama, uh, if there's a drama MFA or any experience there. I, you know, you could, some people can figure this stuff out on their own. Um, documentaries and all sorts of th things. I have been doing journalism, um, which can sometimes, <laughs> really squeeze the creativity out of you sometimes. And, you know, with the, I know what CNF is and you definitely can do it. And I'm interested in doing that, but it's just a tough world lately. And I have just like really exposed myself to this whole other world. I thought about getting an MFA several years ago. And then I thought, oh no, it's too expensive. And but it's just kind of like, I really, really want to do it now. And uh, really not so much to teach, but I just want the, what's the word, the teaching, the, the, the lessons, the education, the, the, the guidance, that's yeah. what I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Ellen. I know that you had a, a, another meeting there, but, um, but thank you for dropping in there. Yes, thank you. Claire, what are you writing? Well, as a college student, um, it's mostly academic writing right now. <laughs> um, but I'm usually drawn to stories that feature family drama or family dynamics. And it's because my mom is actually uh, number six of 15 children. So I feel that if I were to write anything, it'd probably be something along the creative nonfiction lines, just because I have a lot of stories that I would like to tell. Okay, excellent. Now, Mary Lou is an artist. So I, I know Mary Lou, Mary Lou is a friend. But Mary Lou, are, are you writing anything right now? Well, the things that I write right now are connected to art because I write a, a monthly newsletter. Um, and lately it's, it's uh, gotten better, but I would like to learn how to get it even better. But, but in the past, I have written poetry. And after listening to Amanda Gorman, I got very inspired and thought, oh, I would love to get back to that. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, I could see some really beautiful books being created by you, Mary Lou, with, with both your art and poetry. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Uh, Jacqueline, I think you're the last one, if you're still on. No, she may not be on. Okay. Well, we will wrap this up then. It's been uh, wonderful. Does anyone have any last questions before we finish up here? I have a question. Um, yes. So, Sophronia, do you have like certain office hours or do I email you to set up an appointment with you? How would that work? You know, it's funny you should ask because I, I um, just yesterday we were talking about me setting up virtual office hours and uh, we're figuring out how to how to make that work. But but until I do, you can just email me, Claire. I'm I'm I'm, I'm here. Oh, but it's going to be Zoom because I'm not on campus at the moment because of the, the travel restrictions. So I, I live in Connecticut, as you guys know. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. It's been it's been lovely. It, this has almost been like the, a feeling already of, of a bit of community here because this has been just a wonderful mix of people and it was wonderful hearing from all of you. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to have all of these voices together at our first residency. So, Feel free to email me and we will be in touch as well to, to follow up to let, see if you need anything, if you have any more questions to give you access to this recording. But, um, but let me know. Um, my email address is Scott S, so S C O T T S at elma.edu. And I'm happy to talk more and get on the phone and, uh, and we could chat. So, you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you for being here and we'll see you all soon.